Hello there, Drew Hannish of Whiskey Lore, and time for another whiskey tasting. And I just got back from Atlanta and had a chance to go down to the ASW Distillery in Atlanta. I've been wanting to go to this distillery for some time. My Instagram friend, Finnerty18, has been telling me I need to get down there, and so I got a chance to go down with him and also with Chad from the distillery, and we spent about three hours going through their different whiskeys tasting each, talking about philosophy of whiskey, and then going through and doing some tasting from the barrel. So an excellent day, and I really appreciate it. And then I capped the night off by going to see my one of my top five favorite bands, Delamitri, who are a Scottish band, who I like to say prepared me for a life of scotch, because they definitely have their drinking songs, Drunk in the Band, Whiskey Remorse, stone cold sober. Uh, so uh, a fantastic day yesterday. Today I am going to be tasting a whiskey that Chad sent me home with, which uh, after I did all my tastings, he said, what did you really enjoy? This was actually my number two. My favorite is unfortunately a limited edition. They do a Irish style single pot still whiskey called Druid Hills. And it is 30%, um, what is it? It's 30, 30%, uh, 70% malted barley, I'll get it, and 30% unmalted barley. And Irish distillers, I'm telling you, for those of us who taste red breast and we're kind of like on the finish, we go, it's, it's it's got this interesting peppery note, but maybe it's a little bit more than the scotch drinker is used to experiencing. Well, by doing 70% malted barley and 30% of the unmalted barley, you get those wonderful grape nut notes out of the whiskey, and you do get that pepper at the finish, but then you get all of the benefits of the single malt concept, in there as well, and it mutes that finish just a little bit in terms of that pepperiness. So for me, it's a nice little bridge between, and I just, I fell in love with it and think it's a fantastic whiskey, so I will be watching out for that one when it comes around. But my second choice was Duality Double Malt, and we got into a very interesting discussion about the American single malt movement, because they brought up an idea that I hadn't really thought of before. You know, when we talk about malt, we're almost always referring to barley. But you can malt other grains. And so here in Greenville, we have a distillery called 6 and 20, and they came out with something called triple malt. Well, in reality, it's just a single malt because it's made with three different types of malted barley. And so... In the American single malt book, it would be basically considered a single malt. But in the case of duality, it is actually 50% malted barley and 50% malted rye. So it's not actually, it is actually a single malt in a way, or is it? Well, double malt actually kind of makes more sense. So the talk is, do you have the TTB... Uh, and and the, the, the way the law is written, uh, inclusive to malting other types of grain, that it just has to be a single 100% malt. And what's interesting about this particular whiskey here is that in their process, they actually do mash and ferment the rye and the malt together. It goes through the whole process together, same as if you had those three different barley grains all mixed in together. So, you know, my suggestion is that you just call it double malt. It doesn't have to be American single malt, that that is its own thing. And there's still ability to create whiskeys that go outside the line. And that to me, it's more about the distillery itself creating a reputation that it makes excellent whiskeys and that the word whiskey, even though it has a lower standard, you know if a distillery that 
makes quality product all the way around and is very focused on quality product has released something called whiskey no matter what the words are in front of it you know what you're going to get is quality so interesting up for debate love to hear your comments on that what you think should we allow rye malted rye uh let's say somebody made um like colorado 291 let's say they made a 100 percent malted rye is that an american single malt it's an interesting question. It's a very interesting question. So, all right, so I'm gonna jump in and do a nosing and tasting on this. Mm. And this is the cast drink version. There are two versions. I think the other one is 88 proof. This one is 57.3% alcohol by volume. So of course I have to do my math and that'd be 114.6 proof. My math teachers in, in school will be very, very proud of me. This, as I was told, has a lot of little Easter eggs uh, on the label. And so you'll see all this text down both sides. And then you'll see a picture of a knight and a snail. So, of course, I wanted to know about the knight and the snail. And then I did my own research on it afterwards. The, the Gaelic that's written there is actually... The Scottish play's first act, and so it's been written, just the first lines have been written there in Gaelic, but the idea of the knight and the snail is something that goes back into medieval times, and you will find lots of books from that time period that might have in the margin a picture of a knight and a snail, and not always drawn that way. That's its own rendering, but there are other renderings of it as well. And there are theories. Nobody's really got the definitive answer as to what this symbology means, but the, the one I like, and I think the one that could really fit, is that the knight is the aristocracy, the snail are the commoners. And in these depictions, it usually ends up that the snail wins. And you'll see that usually the snail is bigger uh, in size and stature. So to me, that kind of makes sense. It's the idea of, you know, the, the snail, he's a pest in the garden. And then, you know, you've got that going on. Well, then we look at the commoners as the pests to the aristocracy. And that in the end, it is the snail that beats the knight. So there you go. There's a little bit of my mythology for the day. And uh, now let's do some whiskey tasting. What do you say? So this whiskey, when you first put it to your nose and you don't put any water in it, you, the, the stone fruits pop out first. You would think that because this is 50% malted rye and malted rye usually is pretty aggressive in taking over the flavors, see Colorado 291 bourbon, the, the rye actually is playing nice with the malted barley. And so this is 50% uh, rye, 50% cherry smoked malt. And you'll hear the word cherry, and it doesn't always mean that you're going to get a cherry kind of a note out of it. So I've had some it does seem to show up in there, and I don't know if that's just power of suggestion. So there is a smoke on the nose on this. There's citrus that comes in. This is right now at 100%. I haven't diluted anything, so I'm going to do a taste on it, and then I'm going to do, add a little water to it. So I get a toffee little bit of honey in there. Nice. Cinnamon comes in. I get some oak notes in there that come in. A little bit of char. And then as it rolls to the finish, before I was getting char, a little bit of herb, herbally rye was coming in there. Um, still getting it. Um, but I'm also getting like a little biscuity kind of a, a flavor as well, which I usually attribute to something coming from the yeast. Can I add a little bit more here? 
as I guess I have been consuming a little bit of this before, before doing my uh, report. And I'm going to add a little water to it. Actually, I'm going to add a decent amount of water to it. 114 proof to me is, is actually about as far as I like going with cast strength. There are very few that get above that, that I really enjoy drinking that way, that I don't feel like I need to lower the proof some. Interesting, so the smoke notes actually opened up a little bit more in there and that char smell. I want to say I get more of a char smell than I get a, get a smoke note. The floral is there, but it is very, it's very campfire, actually. It is, uh, it's kind of, um, it's got a little ashy kind of a, a, a nose to it. It's a fine line there. It's somewhere between smoke and char. I, I am not sure. And what's interesting about this whiskey is that it is aged in a variety of barrels, from 30-gallon barrels to 53-gallon barrels to 3-char, 4-char, uh, and used cooperage as well, so it goes through a lot. I hope they keep their formulas all straight because that's a, that's a lot of different barrels that it's coming from. Cheers. Mmm. Wow, the toffee and honey, much more apparent with a little water, but wow, it goes to a, a bitter rye note all of a sudden that's kind of mixing with that char isn't that interesting i actually and then that yeasty note comes in at, at the very end that biscuity kind of flavor comes in at the end this is one i might not want to add water to because while it did open up part of the initial flavor in that toffee and that honey coming out I don't know that it actually helped on the finish. It really brought out that that bitterness in the in the rye. Maybe it's coming from tannins. I don't know, but it woke something up that I don't necessarily want to have awakened <laughs> during my. It's an Easter egg. It came popping out. Um, yes, add water, get the Easter egg. Nose is still nice. The stone fruits are not as apparent to me after I add the water to it either. The citrus note actually comes out a little bit more to me. But the oak and that that smoke note are, are there as well. That smoke slash char note on the nose. Very interesting whiskey. I also, you know, I, I say when you pour the first couple of glasses out of a bottle... You have to understand that no oxidization has been taking place and that a bottle actually sometimes is a little better after it's had its time to relax and let things happen. So I'm going to have fun watching this whiskey and seeing how it evolves after now we've got some air, we've got the neck pour out of the way, and we'll see where it goes. Because actually I tasted this at the distillery yesterday and I did not get that bitter tannin note that I was pulling in when I added water to it this time. And I definitely added water yesterday as well. So it may be that the bottle just needs a little time to open up, oxidize, and then we'll get past that. Because I, I like this whiskey, I really do. It's, it's just, uh, wow, where did that come from? So for a while, I may be drinking it without adding the water to it, because I think it's a nice experience that way. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you would like to see more interviews, make sure you subscribe and like that'll get more people to see this video and uh, leave your comments below i'd love to hear what you think and if you've had anything else by asw i got to try a lot of their line yesterday uh one of the interesting ones i had was called tire fire which is a inside joke for southerners um and um and it was really interesting because it came with a a, a smoke it is a peated whiskey and it came with a almost rubber burnt tire kind of a nose and I don't know whether that's coming from the fact that it's called uh, tire fire or not but it was definitely there on on the front end of that whiskey pleasant but it it's one of those things that you're kind of like 
Yeah, you know, like Benchmark. When you drink Benchmark, to me, I sort of get that that burnt tire kind of a uh, taste on that. But this is a much more pleasant version of it. The Benchmark kind of is off-putting. It, it, it tastes like it's a, an issue with the whiskey. So anyway, there you go. My report on ASW, and uh, I will definitely be keeping my eye out for more of their whiskeys in the future. Until next time, cheers and slanjava. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Now more lemon, toffee. It's evolved just while it's been sitting in the glass. So maybe it's good to let it sit in the glass for a little while because I did that yesterday. I bet you that's the ticket. Ooh, nice herbaliness on the end. And I'm not getting that burnt char um, note now. So let it rest in the glass. Very citrusy now on the finish. I like that. Very, very good. Cheers.